So ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, brothers and sisters, comrades, Your Excellency, Minister of Employment and Labor, Mr. Tulak Nkakesi, welcome to WITS University. Welcome to the Global Labor University, and also on behalf of the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung, the FES, welcome to all of you to the very first session of the 2019 Blue Alumni Meeting here at WITS. My name is Bastian Schulz. I am the director of what is called the Trade Union Competence Center of the FES. It's basically uh, the FES's regional trade union project for Sub-Saharan Africa. I'm joined here by my colleague Heinz Bongartz, Dr. Heinz Bongartz, who is the director of the national office. So we have two projects here in South Africa, and one of the, those two is the regional trade union project. And I'm going to facilitate today's session. This panel uh, will serve as the kickoff session for the GLUE alumni meeting, which is an annual meeting of GLUE South African alumni. GLUE South Africa alumni. You will find the uh, alumni sitting more in the front of the room, uh, and I'll give you more information about the Global Labour University here in a second. I would like to start with an introduction and of course a welcome of my panelists. And I would like to start with Comrade Singhis Walosi, President of the Congress of South African Trade Unions, COSATU. Lossi is a trained soldier, and she served in the South African Defense Force for three years. And after she retired from the Army, Losi was employed by Ford, a car manufacturer in Port Elizabeth, as an operator in the engine components and assembly division. She later became a quality inspector and a NUMSA shop steward at the plant. She served in various NUMSA committees, such as finance and education in the Eastern Cape region. And during the 13th National Congress in 2018, she was elected as the first woman president of COSATU. Sister Losi, once again, congratulations. And thank you very much for taking the time to be with us today. Then next to me uh, is Comrade Roof. And Comrade Roof, welcome to your home pitch. Uh, Comrade Roof uh, Klotze is working as a senior laboratory chemist at Jensen Methai. She was elected as a shop steward in 2006 and served in different roles within her union, um, the National Union of Metalworkers South Africa, NUMSA. She served as the regional chairperson of Ecoroleni the national chairperson of gender, and in 2016, she got elected second deputy president of NUMSA. Why did I say home pitch? Ruth is a GLUE alumni, uh, in possession of an honors degree, and she registered for a master's degree in 2017. She just completed her uh, coursework, and she's busy, I mean, obviously not at the moment, doing her research work. Um, Apologies for keeping you busy, although you got uh, the research work to do, but Comrade Ruth, also to you, thank you very much for joining us. And finally, let me introduce our, and I hope he's okay with that, our so-called guest of honor, uh, Comrade Reiner, uh, the president of the German Trade Union Federation, the DGB. In Germany, we would call each other colleagues or Kollegen. On the international level, uh, we would call each other brothers. But Rainer, here in South Africa, you are my comrade. You are our comrade. And therefore, a warm welcome to Rainer Hoffmann, comrade Rainer, to the Global Labour University in Johannesburg. <laughs> Rainer holds a degree in economics and committed essential stages of his life to the cause of the trade union movement. Amongst other things, he served as the director of the European Trade Union Institute, as deputy general secretary of the European Trade Union Confederation, as well as state district leader of the IGBCE, which is the German Trade Union for Mining, Chemicals and Energy Industries. In May 2014, Reiner was elected new president of the DGB, the German Trade Union Federation, and in 2018 he was re-elected uh, for a second term. The DGB, the German Trade Union Federation, has just celebrated its 17th 7-0 birthday. And therefore, happy belated uh, birthday, Comrade Reiner, to the organization that you represent. The DGB is the largest trade union federation in Germany, founded in 40, uh, 1949. Its eight member trade unions represent just under six million members, which is three quarters of all trade union members in Germany. The DGB, as well as its eight affiliates, consider themselves to be nonpartisan, and they receive no funding from any political party, uh, nor do they obtain any state funding or public subsidies. They are exclusively financed by membership fees fees that, for example, I pay to my union. 
Historically, however, the individual trade unions of the DGB have been particularly close to the Social Democratic Party, the SPD, a relationship which fell into crisis in 2003. So 15, roughly 15 years ago. And since then, I would describe the relationship between the DGB and the Social Democratic Party as complicated. But this is a discussion for another two hours meeting. Um, but I would say it's worth mentioning that Comrade Reiner is a member of the Social Democratic Party, as are four out of eight chairs of the DGB affiliates. So once again, Comrade Lossi, Comrade Roof, Comrade Reiner, thank you very much for taking the time to be with us today. As I've mentioned before, this uh, panel serves as the kickoff session for the annual GLU alumni meeting. And I would say 70% of the comrades here in the room know what the Global Labour University is. For the other 30%, GLU is a network of universities, of unions and support organizations. It has six university programs in five different countries, which are Germany, South Africa, Brazil, India and the United States. At one level, the Global Labour University is about ensuring university access to labour movements, workers and labour activists. And at another level, it is about enabling unions and other social movements to engage in the issues of policy, dialogue and debate in order to strengthen their bargaining position. Roughly 650 students have graduated from different GLU programs all over the world, with almost 50% of them being female. 49%, that's a crucial figure for me, 49% of all alumni are African and nearly 80%, 80 are from the so-called Global South. So Reiner uh, and Lossi, as you can see, this network is not only driven by labor from the Global South, now I would even say that with every second alumni being either an African brother or an African sister, it's definitely a very unique network. And that's one of the main reasons why the FES is working very closely with the Global Labor University. So both of you are sitting to an alumni and a current student, but Rainer and uh, Lossi, you will also get the chance to interact with at least 25 representatives of the so-called African Alumni Network. And that finally brings me to the topic of today's um, panel. We will spend hopefully the next 90 minutes talking about the future of work and the role of trade unions, social dialogue, industrial relations and co-determinations. I know some of these, those words and phrases, especially at WITS, are rather controversial and therefore I hope for a very, very, very interesting uh, panel discussion. And I will engage the three panelists on the transformative change in the world of work, driven by technological innovations, by demographic, demographic shifts, by climate change, by globalization, but also urbanization, just to name a few. And we will start with two rounds of questions to the panelists. And then afterwards, uh, you'll get the chance, you, the audience, to interact with um, the panelists. We, will be, we have to be done by like 10.25, because then we will be joined by a very close friend of mine, Comrade Professor Michelle Williams, the chairperson of the Global Labour University. She will also address you. And then we will be honored to also receive concluding remarks from the Minister of Employment and Labour, His Excellency Comrade Tulas, a WITS alumni, as far as I know, um, a former Secretary General of the South African Democratic Teachers Union and former President of the Global Union Federation Education International. Romit, it's an honor to have you with us today. Let me just challenge the panelists and then I'll raise my first question. I, I would say um, that being a unionist today is quite hard and very challenging. And this is because, not exclusively, but this is also because of the technologi technological and economic changes that affect the nature and type of jobs. And with that, the potential of organizing and representing workers, both in the North as well as the Global South. I would say, is it, I would say that the challenge of technological innovation for trade unions is less the volume than the quality of jobs. The quality of jobs and what that means for the earnings and the rights of workers globally. I would say that a new instability of work has come to characterize labor relations in the 21st century and that unions face at least two significant challenges. On the one hand, it's the digital economy and the way it transforms jobs and employment relationships. We could do a little test question and ask how many participants or members of the audience actually took an Uber to come to WITS today. But it's also the social divide between workers with stable paying jobs on the one hand 
and workers with unstable, poorly paid or precarious jobs or no jobs at all. I am convinced, or the FAS is convinced, that it must be the core task of trade unions, of trade union representatives, to defend the rights of workers in those changing and the very fast developing new sectors. But this, however, can only be achieved if trade unions do not allow for a vacuum to develop where large enterprises only decide on the future of work. This understanding is what is driving the FES uh, not only in Sub-Saharan Africa, but especially in Sub-Saharan Africa. Because currently the debate, let's just take South Africa as an example, the debate by governments and business on new technologies, on digitalization, on the fourth industrial revolution, is more or less limited to the question of how these technologies contribute to economic development, to growth and the, to the creation of wealth. However, such a very technical economic approach clearly neglects the social consequences of technological innovation. And I would like to quote, I don't do that very often, but I'd like to quote the Director General of the ILO, Guy Ryder, Guy Ryder who authored a report in 2015 saying that we live in a context of great uncertainty and insecurity and of fear that the direction of change in the world of work is away from and not towards the achievement of social justice. And I would say this is rather strong language uh, for an ILO representative. So it is our belief as FES that in order to build the future we want, we have to take the dignity of workers at the center of the debate. And I'm quite sure this is what our debate at the panel will be about today as well. And to do so, in order to put the dignity of workers in the center of the debate, it needs strong and representative trade unions in order to play an active role in shaping the world of work. As the world of work is obviously changing at an ever-increasing pace, strong, influential and inclusive social dialogue may be, is, and it's our belief will be an essential vehicle to shape the future world of work that we want. So with those few words, uh, I would like to actually invite Comrade Reiner to join the discussion. Um, Comrade Reiner, the first question I would like to address to you is from a German or from a European perspective. How do you perceive the changing world of work, the so-called future of work? Would you say that unions are in a strong position to actively shape the future of work? Or in Germany, as well as in Europe, is it more large corporations who determine the parameters of the debate? I would like you to take up to like 10 minutes to respond to the questions, and then I would like to invite Ruth and Glossy to join the discussion. Yeah, dear uh, comrades, uh, thanks. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I'm <laughs> learning every day, a lifelong learning. Yeah. Uh, it's a pleasure uh, and it's an honor to be with you because I remember quite well, as I have been the director of the European Trade Union Institute in Brussels, Frank Hoffer, a good friend of mine, he worked uh, at that time at the ACTRAF, uh, at the ILO in Geneva, came with the idea to establish the Global Labour University and I thought at that time it was a really ambitious project and if I see now 15 years later the result of this great project I can only say it's fantastic congratulations and I'm so glad to be with you and uh, to have the opportunity to exchange uh, views and experiences from a uh, from a German uh, the trade union perspective um, so having said so we have in in Germany uh, an elaborated debate uh, on the future of work um, this is nothing new uh, for a trade unionist because our experiences was always that the world of labor is uh, changing uh, const uh, constantly. Uh, it's, it's not nothing uh, really new. And if I compare the debate in the 70s and the 80s uh, in, uh, in Germany, there was a fear that based on new technologies uh, we could lose jobs, unemployment would uh, be on the increase. And we have been quite skeptical. This has shifted uh, to some extent that we have a debate in Germany which is focusing on the opportunities um, and not only focusing on risks. As a trade unionist we are pretty much aware uh, about the risks and the consequences for jobs. But the approach we have taken nowadays is to look more carefully what are really the opportunities for new types of work which has huge potential to have even better work, more decent work uh, based on technological innovation. The precondition is that we have to ask ourselves not only what is technologically 
feasible. Uh, we have to put into the center what is in the interest of workers and more generally what is in the interest of human beings to make use of these potentials by uh, the digitalization of the economy. Uh, this is not an easy task uh, and uh, to, to address uh, uh, the answer to your question, uh, big corporations are sitting in the, uh, in the driving seat and sometimes are we running behind. So the question for us is how uh, we will be able to sitting more in the, in the driving seat and not running behind technological innovations. And uh, one of my biggest affiliates, uh, the Metal Workers Union in Germany, they conducted a survey a couple of months ago for the metal sector in Germany and they discovered that approximately two thirds of the companies are not really prepared for this digital, uh, for this process of digital uh, transformation, which is ridiculous because if you are not prepared, this will have negative consequences for jobs in the future. And the precondition for us to shape those processes is by the end of the day, uh, skills and qualification. Um, this uh, is, a, is a precondition uh, if, we, uh, if we like to make use of the opportunities. This will be uh, possible only uh, by uh, adequate skills, uh, training and education. And what we are experiencing is that the, uh, the new technologies, uh, the, the implementation of new technologies is accelerating so fast. Uh, and if this uh, is a process uh, we are running always behind, there is a precondition that we say, nowadays, lifelong learning must be put into the center. It cannot be that we are faced with, te not with uh, technological innovations and running be behind uh, with competences and qualifications uh, for the workers. And by doing so, a uh, second precondition for us in Germany is that we are involved in the process not only after new technologies have been implemented at the company level, it has to start at the early beginning. And to, to have risk assessments in advance, what does it mean for jobs? Um, probably you know some um, uh, research, some academic work um, uh, have predicted uh, that there will be a huge risk uh, to lose jobs. Um, and if I take the two scholars from the Oxford University, um, they predicted that we will f lose 50% of the jobs. Uh, in Germany, I'm not quite sure that this will be really the case. We have other serious studies that we will lose in the next probably 10 years, um, 2 million, 2.5 million uh, jobs in Germany. At the same time, we will be able to create two, two and a half million new jobs. The problem is we are not quite sure where those developments will take place. So here we have to be involved and this is, uh, if I say we have a second uh, precondition that workers have to be um, uh, involved from the early beginning, what we are calling workers' participation and uh, co-determination at the plant level. Um, in order really to shape those processes and we need um, we need um, uh, certainly an extension of workers right in the digital economy and I will uh, finish by by two aspects which are really really <coughs> crucial uh, the digital economy is based on new business models and new business models for example the so-called platform economy uh, this uh, creates uh, really new challenges. Uh, Uber, uh, the example has been uh, mentioned. Um, it's a platform. Uh, it's offers, uh, offering uh, a service, uh, transport service. But who is the employer and who is the employee? And this creates really new challenges that in the platform economy we have to have a uh, new understanding of employers and the responsibilities of employers in the platform economy and to define what is a worker in the digital economy. Because th those co colleagues are not uh, simply self-employed uh, colleagues. They are false uh, self-employed colleagues because they are not covered 
in this new economy by social security systems. They are not covered by collective agreements. Uh, they are not covered by lifelong uh, learning measures. So this is uh, a challenge and this is on the increase. And the problem here is <clears throat> that this can not be managed any longer at the national level. It is even not sufficient enough to do it at the European level. No, we have to do it at the global level and the ILO is becoming here more and more relevant because in the platform economy, if I offer uh, specific services, for example, uh, a translation on a platform, it, is, it doesn't matter where people are doing these jobs. It can be done in Johannesburg, it can be done in Berlin, it can be done in Paris or elsewhere. So, and they're offering their services um, and there are self-employed people not covered and here we have a decent frame uh, on a global level who is an employer, who is covered by social security uh, systems and uh, the other thing is, uh, important thing is with the uh, digital economy we are producing huge, huge uh, um, uh, data uh, basises and who are the owner of those state datas? Uh, this is a big question. Uh, this leads to, a, in, in, uh, leads to a, uh, another uh, challenge, another question. What does it mean for uh, competition and com competitive law? Because it's not only a question of labor law. If the big uh, five um, platform companies, mainly located in the United States, are the owners of huge volumes of data, what is, who will control the data? Who are the owners of the data? These are extremely new questions we have to address. And here again, we will not be able to find national or even uh, European solutions. We have to act and to deal with it at a global scale. Uh, scale. And therefore, I think uh, the ILO will become more and more important in future. And I think, therefore, also what uh, we are doing, what you are doing with the Global Labour University is the right approach uh, to reflect those challenges and to identify responses uh, which are serving to the workers and not only to the new digital uh, forms of capitalism. Thank you very much, Comrade Reiner. I think you got us right into the centre of the discussion um, and I would like now to invite Ruth and, and Lossi to join us. Uh, Ruth, from a, from a South African perspective, well, the question is to both of you, but I'll start with Ruth. From a South African perspective, how do you perceive the changing world of work, the so-called future of work? Would you say that, that, you, that unions, maybe your own union, Ruth, is in a strong position to actively shape the future of work, or is it rather in a defensive mode? And I would like you maybe to share your experiences from, from the shop floor, from the metal sector, and then Comrade Lossi to follow with a with a perspective uh, from the Federation on the national uh, level, but also from a, from a political, political perspective. Amanda, we do. Are we do. thank you very much, Program Director. It's, it's good to be, ho to be home. Thank you very much for, for the invitation. I think with the stagnation of the real economy, where we've seen the global economy that is not creating the sustainable growth, and we know that in the past, the capitalist system would use its creativity and would be able to mutate. But now, this system is confronted with the biggest threat, the threat that it has never seen before, which is the digital, uh, digital revolution, the artificial intelligence, the digitization, and the automation. The, okay, this technology is different from any other technology that was created by humanity. Its efficiency has changed and reshaped the notion of work. I think Comrade Reina is correct that the data is at the central and is the building block of this artificial intelligence. We've seen in our workplaces that the software is developed using this uh, data and this software, it can be able to recognize faces. It can be able to recognize the gender identity. It's called biometrics. And through this biometrics, voices can be listened of workers. It can monitor the absenteeism. It can even increase surveillance. We had cases like, we had a case in ESCOM where one of the cars was installed with civilians 
and a member was charged, the reasons that were advanced to install the civilians in that car, it was only the purpose of monitoring the driving pattern of a driver. But during the disciplinary hearing, the, 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 the member was told that even the discussions were recorded, so which simply means that workers are continuously under civilians. And this type of technology, it delinks the hours of work from the wages. People can now work from home and everything is automated, if you may put it in that way. We are moving in South Africa slowly but for sure towards a system where even the portal station will be automated. And we've seen it in other countries that petrol station, they are no longer forecourt attended. They are automated and uh, people can be able to pour petrol by themselves. And this type of uh, technological revolution, it is slowly destroying the economy that is based on the market and private ownership. And it creates a gig economy that is managed online. We've seen through the Uber that workers, they don't know who is their employer. Uh, they, their kind of the relationship is managed online. And the impact of this online, it's, um, it's, it, it has an impact towards the industrial relations. Workers, they don't know who's their employer. We know under normal circumstances in this type of economy that we are, we are living in, that workers will be appraised. But if under this gig economy, people will be, you know, this type of a, a surveys where normally customers will be made. So workers are not going to have an input in relation to their, to their performance. So we simply means that um, that type of the industrial relations is it's, it's affected as a result of this digitization. And then also, we've seen how workers are being exploited in the Uber, they're working long hours, um, the safety of those employers get compromised. And the question that we're asking ourselves is, this kind of a civilians, why is it not picking up if a worker is under his or her safety, it's threatened. But the only thing that it does, it monitors only the movements of workers. In the past sectors, uh, how our agreement are structured, there's this issue that is talking about the foot on the pedal, where if a, a co-driver is not physically driving, because of normally in the long distances we have two drivers, so if the co-driver is not driving, it means he or she won't be paid while the other one is, is driving. They will start to be paid as soon as they start putting their foot on the pedal, and it's monitored using this kind of a civilians. Um, this type of the digitized, it does have the gender aspect on it. In as much as uh, it reduces this physical, physicality of work, where we've seen women can no longer be doing the physical nature of work. But at the same time, by virtue of allowing people, people to work at home, it compromises the, the, that caregiving, because of will forever be sitting in the laptop that is under surveillance, and you end up neglecting the aspect of being a parent. So it does have a gender aspect on it. So answering to the question of whether trade unions we are reactive or defensive, I must say it that it depends on the mode in which uh, the union operates. We are defensive, and at the same time, we're a little bit uh, uh, proactive in ensuring that we address uh, the challenges that are confronting workers. But when it comes to the issue of being reactive, we normally come in and represent workers without necessarily being part and parcel of the processes in ensuring that we determine the, the agenda on how this data should be utilized. I think I'll end it there. Thank you, Thank you very much, Komitou. I think we're going to share this, this mic and you're going to share this one because they obviously work better. Komit Lossi, please join us. Would you say that labor in South Africa is strongly and effectively shaping the, the discussion around the future of work or is it more on a defensive note and Thank i know that might be difficult for you because uh, you also have a government representative it's, but it's please even feel better that he's here. feel protected you are with us it's even uh, better that he's here it's 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 quite good that great. the minister is seated here for <laughs> yours. Thank you very much, <laughs> questions and, and greetings to everyone uh, the minister uh, president and uh, deputy president ruth Perhaps, and I was thinking, what is the question that we should be responding to? 
other than are we being proactive or reactive? Is the economy of South Africa ready for a full blast of this 4 IR? Sitting at 29% of unemployment, if you take the extended definition, you are talking about 39%. If you are to go for full automation, full digitalization, what is the impact to the economy? So, and, and you raise the issue of social uh, consequences, which are not going to be avoided. But hence I say the importance of having the minister here is the, whether government is ready to deal with those social consequences. Because when we enter this debate of the fourth industrial revolution, of course we appreciate that every revolution that has been from the first to the third is as a result of responding to a need. Steam engine was responding to a need of efficiency in agrarian, agrarian and the second revolution was responding to, uh, you know, we are safe, we have electricity and all of that. And the third revolution, computerization, which at some point, some of us in South Africa were still on the third uh, industrial revolution. Now, is the economy ready? And my response will be no, it is not. Are we reactive? Are we being defensive? Ruth puts it quite correctly. We are going to defend because we understand the consequences if we were to allow it to come full blast. We are proactive because we are saying let us have a discussion about the impact of it. And, and indeed there are opportunities, as the President have said, which, for an example, and I make this argument, that we sit here with a crisis in the banking sector because uh, the big banks are closing branches. Okay? At times we sit at here are the reason why we have that challenge. Because we sit comfortably there, you don't have to go and chew in a banking line. You can do it while you are seated here. So we're able to multitask being in this meeting and be able to do your banking. Very effective. So probably it is the opportunities that come with, I think we are still in the third uh, uh, industrial revolution. Ruth puts it quite eloquently and she says, it makes work efficient and you don't have to do the manual strained labor. But if we were to allow it to lack what the ILO report uh, puts it as the basis, the human-centered approach, then the entire economy is not going to flourish. So we make this argument as a federation that a growth in the absence of people that are generating an income cannot be a growth if that growth will exist because even if you were to automate each and every sector, the computers are not consuming the products that they will be generating. So they can produce, automate every workplace and see who's going to come and buy because no one will be able to do so because no one is working and therefore no one is earning a salary to enable one to have a buying power. So the economy cannot grow because no one is able to generate the money is not, is not moving. So yes, you can plan and want to be in advance and, and digitalize the economy, put artificial intelligence, we go to restaurants, we go and eat, we don't have to have waiters that are waitering us because computers will be doing that. But you will have overproduction and less consumption. So consequences are not only for us as labor, but a dire consequences for the economy itself. And the burden that government has to be dealing with is that once you have more people, you see, we're sitting at 29% of unemployment. Extended definition is 39. And if you are to automate each workplace, that unemployment levels are going to be rising. 
which will mean more people will have to move to the social security, but you will have less people that are paying tax to enable the fiscus to deal with that social security. So you have more people moving to the social security, but you have no uh, income for government to be able to provide that social. So it's a contradiction on its own. Hence, ours, as Ruth says, as much as we must embrace and move with it, but we have to contextualize it. What is it that our economy requires currently? Because even on the issues of climate change, the big economies have not just jumped to climate change and wanted to uh, implement the Paris Agreement. They said, but if we were to move to that, what is the impact on our economy, the impact on jobs? And they said, we're not going to move, not now, we're not ready. So, and we make this argument and we say, China is the biggest economy. Their unemployment rate is sitting at 3%, but they are the ones that are producers of this digital economy. So how are they doing it? It is because there's a point in time when China said, what is it that is good for Chinese and the Chinese economy? And they responded to that. So it is going to take all of us as social partners in this country to really speak to what is our economy ready for? Are we able to move with full digitalization or we're going to move together? And this story that companies did not know, there is no company that is able to plan and forecast and tell us that they woke up tomorrow not knowing that they're going to need a cloud engineers that Standard Bank is saying. So they may decide to move ahead, but even their businesses will not strive in the absence of workers. So it is all of us having to strike that balance in response to what the economy of South Africa indeed needs and the economy, because our economy is not only responding to ourselves, but we are responding to the region and the continent. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Comrade Lossi. Uh, Reiner, uh, taking into consideration what Ruth and, and Sinkiswa have said, I mean, they've talked mainly about challenges um, and, and concerns. Where do you see the potential for effective trade union intervention in South Africa? And I would like to add, we all know, and you know, that the, the South African context differs quite heavily from the German one. Yeah. Lossi mentioned the level of unemployment in South Africa sitting officially at 29. The extended figure is 39, even 40. Reiner, correct me if I'm wrong. In Germany, we're sitting slightly above 5%. Um, so the Was context differs. But where do you see the role for industrial relations in South Africa as a very experienced trade unionist? I think you made a very important point in asking, is the South African economy ready for going towards digitalization? Uh, having in mind that unemployment rate is uh, relatively high, that you have a huge uh, informal sector which is not uh, addressed to the uh, economic system. Um, so the consequence is you are putting uh, the uh, putting to bring it to the point that we need the right macroeconomic framework. Uh, so, what are the preconditions um, to, as you said, to create employment? Uh, and a high employment rate is a precondition that you have rel relatively good social security systems because you have to contribute to the social security systems and to have, uh, to ha you have to create uh, jobs and employment. And this can be done mainly by investment. And if I see the needs for investment uh, also in relation to climate change, it is huge. This is one of the debates we have also in Germany. Coming to the point, making the reference to Germany, we have in comparison, to, uh, in comparison with, the city, with the situation in South Africa, certainly a totally uh, different situation. Nevertheless, also in Germany, we have a divided labor market. The unemployment rate is nowadays relatively low, below 5%, but 20% of the employees are belonging to the so-called low-wage sector. People are earning less than 60% uh, of the medium. This is the definition of working poor. So one, in, one of the richest country. Um, with a very strong economy, Germany, has in Europe the highest low-paid sector 
uh, at all. Um, and how we can address this? Uh, this has to be addressed via, certainly, investment. Investment to bring those people into decent jobs. And we're having a discussion now on climate change, uh, that we go for specific measures uh, for uh, CO2 uh, taxation. Uh, this is, a, is an opportunity, uh, why not? Uh, but the consequence is to which extent those taxation uh, will really steer the economy towards a low carbon economy. And this is not only a question for taxation, because here the risk is for, and therefore I make the link with the low page sector in Germany, those who are earning really uh, less uh, low uh, uh, incomes uh, level, they can't afford to pay additional climate uh, taxations, uh, because they are depending on their cars to go 50, 60, 70 kilometers every day to work and uh, going uh, back and forwards. Uh, they are living in houses uh, which have not uh, decent uh, um, uh, systems for uh, saving uh, energy and so on and so forth. So here I think it's important, can we make an intelligent link to have technological innovations, having investment, investment uh, in uh, um, measures uh, towards uh, climate change, uh, that means investments in infrastructure, in affordable housing, and so on and so forth. So the, the needs for intelligent investments are huge. And then by the end of the day is, again, the question of financing it. And here, also in Germany, I think we have huge discrepancies to have a fair taxation system, that those who can afford higher taxation should pay for those investments implemented by governments so that we have uh, this link um, to round up uh, the, the picture and what uh, we can do as, as a trade union movement. Certainly um, stimulating for growth via investment, uh, making sure that you have the f a solid financial basis for investment. That means we have to have a much more fair taxation system that those who are earning more are paying more also for those uh, uh, investments which are necessary and then making use of intelligent technologies to met the climate targets uh, agreed in Paris uh, and uh, if you have such a comprehensive approach I think then uh, it could uh, be feasible to have a win-win situation and to create especially employment for those people who are not covered by our labor markets who are excluded from the labor markets which is uh, one of the biggest challenges uh, as I can see also for you in South Africa. Thank you very much, Comrade Rainer. Um, Comrade, Comrade Lossi, taking Rainer's response into consideration. How do we, how do trade unions in South Africa ensure that unions do not lag behind um, in the developments in the changing world of work? Um, how do we break new ground? How can Kusatu break new ground um, in the discussion of the future world of work? Thank you very much. I think Importantly, it is for us to be part of uh, the, the engagements, but also not only at the national level, but I think at the workplace. Uh, if employers term us to be stakeholders, it must be in the true sense that we are indeed stakeholders in, 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 in driving the economy uh, and ensuring that where there's productivity, but at the same time, it does not result to exploitation. And now we have to, for an example, we always make this argument that we have sitters in our country. We may also need to say from the labor point of view that what is the mandate of the sitters and are they relevant now to what the economy requires? Because we don't want sitters that are going to be ticking the box because we have done training and therefore we have used money. But is the training that is offered, offered by the CETAs relevant to what the sectors now are moving towards? Because each, set, each CETA is responsible for a sector in the economy. So we need CETAs that are going to make that research and say, in this particular CETA, looking at the global uh, transition, 
This is where we are transiting to. Therefore, is the training that we're giving relevant? Therefore, workers then can be upskilled and reskilled. We have to look into what are the opportunities, as the President have said earlier. Uh, so each sector, when it moves to digitalization, the gig economy, what are the opportunities of new sectors that are going to be created? Now, if we are able to understand those new sectors, then it will mean we will then understand what are the skills that are going to be needed. So including the, the, the education system has to be overhauled in our country because you can't have an education system that is not responsive or aligned to what the labor market requires. So it, 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 it will be those, including the issues of just transition. So we have a long life of coal, many years of coal in our country. So are we going to move to the clean energy only or we're going to talk about the mixed energy and also talking about clean coal? Because what is it? Because we may have to get into a discussion that says, what are the opportunities of coal? Even if you were to move to the clean energy with the lifelong many years of coal that we still have, are we just going to discard our coal or are we going to bring new technologies? But can also South Africa begin to be inventors of this technology? Because sometimes we consume things that are not made by us. A simple example is in the steel. We will break for lunch and we go and we eat and when we sit there we don't use our hands uh, because we want to be yeah, diplomatic. So we have fork and knife and a spoon. Turn it, look at it made in China, but South Africa is a steel producer. Why must we still import that from China when Chinese are importing steel from us? So what is it that we can do with what we have? You know, as I, as, as I finish, Dr. Ngwame Nkrumah says, um, Africa is rich, but its people are poor. So it is about to do we acknowledge what we have? And investors, when they come to South Africa, what are they looking for? They're investing here because there are opportunities. Are we able to, to, to understand the opportunities that we have as a country and what are we doing about them? It is going to be our South African government that is going to support South African businesses to move beyond our borders, just like Chinese do when their businesses are moving. Because the reason why China has 3% of unemployment rate, it is because they migrate labor from China to Africa and they count that as people that are working in China even though they are moving. So when they come with investment, they are not bringing opportunities for us. They are saying we shall bring you, we shall build infrastructure for you and do this. But they are addressing high levels of unemployment in China so they migrate their labor to come to South Africa so that they do not have a crisis of high levels of unemployment and they use our own because they don't bring cement, they don't bring anything, they bring human beings and they use what we have to build the infrastructure but addressing the issues that China is confronted with until we think like they do and we acknowledge what we have and know that any investor that comes here it is because of the opportunities that exist in our country. Are we using those opportunities to address our own problems? Thank you very much, Comrade, Comrade Ruth. Um, last question to the panel. How do, how do we make sure that unions uh, and that NUMSA, for example, does not lag behind in the developments in the changing world of work? And I would like you also to speak briefly on the question, where do you see the Global Labour University? within the discussion of the future world of work as an alumni and as a current student of the GLU. Thank you very much, Comrade Chair. I think first and foremost, we, we need a tailored studies, studies that will capture the development in each and every sector. If you can look at the report from the ILO, it gives an indication that this digitization and artificial intelligence, it affects sectors differently. So we need not to generalize, we need studies that will be able to tell us what is happening in each and every sector so that we can be able to formulate the concrete approach for each and every sector. And then for the GLU, I think it will be important that GLU should run a course that will help trade unions on how to organize 
these new sectors, especially the gig sectors, because of this is a new sector, and we are quite aware that if you can look at the statistics, that slowly but for sure, the economy of the country is moving towards that uh, gig economy. And the social dialogue, especially in our workplaces, is very crucial, because of there's nothing about us without us. We normally say that as trading honest. So workers must be part and parcel of the process. Uh, workers, we must be able to be in a position of deciding the type of or the kind of work, the task and the activities that should be automated. And then sec secondly, also on the social dialogue. You know, I spoke about the issue of civilians. We, we need to be in a position as workers to be able to understand why is this civilians implemented? Will it serve the purpose of security? It should be the last resort. We, we need to influence the, the discussion in that front. And also, we need a political will. I think the state should act as an enabler of technology. We need a situation where the state will invest in research and development in order to assist companies in identifying new technologies and technology for production. And they must be able to be innovative. That's why I'm saying that the state must act as an enabler of technology. Also on the political will, we need enforcement. We've got Skills Development Act, but if you could see the actual objective of the skills, it might be as good, but good as nothing. Because of when it comes to enforcement, how many companies are implementing the skills <coughs> development? So that's why we are saying that we need a political will. And also on the political will, we need laws that will, prov that will protect the privacy of workers. Because of through, this, through these biometrics, workers privacy get compromised we've got a case in my workplace where a member was told that continuously she's going to a bathroom because of we've got biometrics that illustrate that the worker at a specific time he went to a bathroom so the privacy of workers they get compromised and we know that outside our workplaces we've got laws that are protecting the right of customers why we not have lo having laws in our workplaces that will protect the privacy we know that CVs, they get utilized, not for the internet purposes. Companies will go and build their database using the information that they got from the CV. So that's why we're saying that we need laws that will protect uh, those workers. And I think lastly, as the trading on movement, we, we, we need to rebuild, we need to go back to basics. Because of if we don't have strength at the shop floor, if you don't have workers that can be able to understand the, the implications of these technological innovations. Uh, employees will do as they please. So like as NUMSA, we are in a process of rebuilding the workplace power. We are capacitating our shop stewards so that they can be able to drive this gender agenda. And if there's a need of resistance, I mean, workers at the workplace should be able to drive that resistance. I think these are the things that I felt that it's necessary as trade unions we should be advancing. I thank you. Thank you very much, Comrade Roof. I couldn't agree more with what Roof uh, and Zikiswa have said. Um, I would now like to invite uh, the audience. Uh, I don't think there's much of a need to summarize what has been said because the panelists clearly interacted with each other. But what came out is, uh, is clearly the question of, of who is the employer, who is the employee, who is the worker at the end of the day? That's a big question for unions all over the world. What is the workplace and where is it? And what does that mean for the future of industrial relations? Um, the big question that came up with, uh, was, that, is the South African economy ready for uh, the future of work, for the fourth industrial revolution, for a full blow of automatization? And what I got from the two South African labor representatives is that although sometimes technological innovation is more perceived as a threat or the outcomes, and I think, Ruth, you've illustrated very well what the outcomes of technical, uh, technological innovation at the workplace uh, are sometimes. Uh, unions are obviously aware of the social consequences of the fourth industrial revolution, of automatization and of, of digitalization. But the big question is whether governments is, government is aware of it. 
whether the state is aware of it. And I'm quite sure this is a question that the comment minister uh, uh, will, will respond to. But now I would like to invite the audience. We are slightly behind time. I would like to give five to six people the chance to uh, raise a question. I would like only those people who have a question to raise their arm. We are more than 100 people. Um, I would like to have all of you briefly introduce yourself. What's your name? Where are you coming from? What's your union? And then please raise a question, if possible, directly to one of the panelists. So can, please, can you please raise your arm if you have a question? I'd like to get an overview. I got Jane in the back. I got a comment over there. I got Devin. Okay, there we go. It's, I would like to start if I've recognized comment Jane, Jane properly. Jane, you've raised your arm to start. And we have five questions on Warren, what is, from my perspective, the left side. Come with Jane. Okay. Who I am, I'm Jane Barrett, and I'm, I'm from Women in Informal Employment Globalizing and Organizing, WeGo, as it's known. And we work with informal workers. So it's a bit disappointing that there's no input on those that are most marginalized, because just as the you know the argument about increasing um, employment creates consumption cr increasing improving the livelihoods of informal workers also increases consumption and it's really important that in this debate we have some focus on those that are currently completely excluded from from all of the discussion and those is the self-employed who are dependent on policies of the state and particularly at local government level for access to space to trade, for access to places to sort their, their recyclables, I'm talking about waste pickers and so on. And we really need strategies that start to include those people, those workers who are workers in a dependent relationship. They are not some sort of fanciful um, entrepreneur. And those people constitute one in five of our workforce. So my question is, when is the labor movement going to seriously engage with that whole category of the workforce that is currently excluded from social protection, from labor legislation? The Department of Labor refuses to recognize their organizations as trade unions, for example. And, and so forth. I know there are processes underway at a national level to, to renegotiate uh, the, the, the labor laws and so forth, but we really need the proper support, not lip service, from the trade union movement to make all of these really important changes happen and the recognition of informal workers, particularly those who are currently so-called self-employed, but nevertheless in a dependent relationship. Thank you very much, Comrade Jane. Uh, Comrade Devon. Why has the labor movement, both Saftu and Kosatu and, and others, not embraced the Million Climate Jobs campaign? Great. Thank you, Warren. Then our sister from Ghana raised her arm. You mentioned the need for a revolution. For every revolution, there is a purpose. So for me, I believe the fourth revolution that we are all faced with, there is a reason for the coming in of the fourth revolution. My question is, as trade unions and COSATO for that matter, what have you done in this area of embracing the fourth revolution? Because I believe it is something that we can't let go. We need to embrace it. But how ready are we as a trade union? You spoke about the economy. But as a trade union, seeing ourselves as stakeholders, how ready are we to embrace this fourth revolution? Thank you. OK, then well, there was a brother two rows behind, Odelia. Yeah. Our, our, our legislation uh, calls for workplace forums. The, at the heart of this discussion about the union involvement in digital, digital economy, etc., is worker participation, right, which you don't have in South Africa. Right. Um, and, and the labor movement rejected it, obviously. We, do, we don't have workplace forums. And in the, in the room, there are two comrades, Comrade John Apolis and Comrade Vishwas, who are sitting on both sides of the fence, arguing this uh, uh, point. Now, what are the lessons uh, from Germany about workplace forums? Uh, sorry, work councils, 
We've had co-determination for South Africans. And for South African comrades, do we have a worker participation agenda to influence development, industrialization, and digitization? Thanks. OK, and the final question, uh, my comrade here in the front. Thank you. Um, my name is Ebenezer Ewusi Mensah. I'm from the Public Services Workers Union, Ghana. Um, my question goes to my two comrades from South Africa. Um, decided, or let's say, um, if the government of South Africa decides to implement the fourth revolution, um, neglecting the social consequences that comes with it, what would be the drastic um, measure trade unions in South Africa going to take to um, protect the interest of workers? Okay, thank you very much. I'd like to have uh, Comrade Roof start responding to the question. Or Lucy, do you want? Then uh, we're gonna use this mic. There was a bunch of questions with regards to what is labor, South African labor's agenda towards the fourth industrial revolution? And there was one question then for Comrade Reiner, the one that I was waiting for. Uh, your experiences with co-determination and the role of works councils, as the Comrade Riley alluded to, uh, in theory, there would be the possibility for works council in South Africa, in South Africa, but in reality, they are non-existent, and there are many reasons for that. But the question was straightforward with regards to that. But I'd like Comet Comet Lossi to start. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for the questions. There's a direct question from my sister in Ghana: What has Kosadu done to embrace the four IR? As we have said, that we are in the process; we are engaging at different platforms. Some of our comrades are representing us in the presidential committee that is looking into this. We are ensuring that departments are not moving ahead and uh, because we are also participating at the level of network because that's where policy gets to be developed. Now, we are at all platforms in ensuring that we do participate in the engagements. But as we said, that it is important for us because we are also sitting in the seaters to are we driving that agenda? And this is what we have said that we should be focusing on, as it as being relevant. But also is business, importantly, uh, not moving ahead and leaving all of us behind? We indeed cannot reject this. As I've said, it is because there's a need. But also, we have to strike that balance because the consequences are dire either way. And given on the climate change, there's technology that cleans coal. It may not clean it completely, but there is, because other developed economies are using that technology. And if you look at their levels of unemployment, they are sitting very low from us. But importantly, what we have said as a trade union movement is that to our own government, that you own the land, okay? You can't allow particularly the independent power producers to be the major players in the mixed economy and in the clean economy. We are not rejecting the, 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 the clean energy. We are not rejecting it, but we're saying government, you must be the bigger player because currently when the IPPs are the ones that are going to be the bigger player in this economy of, 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 of clean energy, the consequences are also that electricity is going to become unaffordable, okay? If we are embracing the fourth industrial revolution, high, most people being unemployed, you have electricity that is becoming unaffordable, you have a social crisis in the country. Now, how are you going to strike the balance? Because we have to acknowledge what is taking place globally, but we have to put it in the South African context. That is why we are saying to our government, let us use, for an example, we are having just a meeting on Monday, and we are saying to the ANC leadership, with the uh, Comrade Ruth, the, the, the plants that government in, in relation to the energy sector may begin to close down. Why are you closing down and, and saying they are no longer going to use it because of their lifespan has expired? Instead of putting solar panels, yeah, they were going to decommission. They are planning about decommissioning those. So fine, you decommission, but you can use it. Because you can put solar panels on top, but government has to be the major player even in that space. Because if you allow private sector, then you're going to have a crisis of people, because it's going to be profits over and above addressing the social 
ills and the social issues that our people must be uh, the beneficiaries of in terms of services. Comrade Jane, lastly for me, Kosatu is working with StreetNet. Where there are opportunities, where Kosatu, for an example, has an opportunity to engage a government, even at the international uh, space, we bring along those comrades and we create a platform using a labor platform. Last, just now in, in Geneva, in the International Labor Conference, comrades from StreetNet were there, but coming through the labor uh, 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 movement uh, to say, we are creating a platform for you to be able to address your issues. Because sometimes if we want to speak on behalf of those that are in the informal economy, we may not understand fully and appreciate what they are going through. Importantly for us is to create those platforms for them. We are at NetLeg and our social uh, uh, dialogue at NetLeg does not el uh, exclude uh, the community. So we have civil society community that is also having a voice on the labor market issues. So we create platforms, but we are not going to be the ones that are speaking on behalf, as Comrade Ruth eloquently put it, nothing with about us without us. And we are saying, here are the platforms where you do not have work with us because we will be able to create those platforms, but we want to hear your voices on those matters. But I guess also the president in his last State of the Nation address has always put this issue of the informal economy and the local economy and focusing on it. And that political will that Ruth spoke about is important because it does not matter to have it in a piece of paper, but it's about whether it is going to be implemented, it gets to be implemented, because that's where we're going to begin to feel the change. Thank you very much. Yeah, Comrade Ruth, nothing about us without us. How do you make sure that uh, workers voices are heard in all the discussions that also Comrade Ruth alluded to. Thank you very much, Comrade. Let me start with the question that was asked by Comrade Dumujalifa. Workers' perspective to influence, what is workers' perspective to influence digitization? I think one of the things that we need to acknowledge as South Africa, it's the fragmentation of the labor. That it is actually putting the struggle of workers backward. It, at the network level, where issues or the policies are being influenced, large chunk of workers are not sitting at that level. Manufacturing, where NUMSA, if I may put it in that way, is organizing. We are hit hard by this digitization. We're not there. That's why I'm saying that this social dialogue, we need to extend it even below, beyond that level. So this fragmentation of labor, it's killing us as workers. And I'm glad that we have started. We've seen it at ESCOM. Workers at ESCOM, they said enough is enough. Let's unite at the shop, lo at the shop floor level. And we saw the impact of it. We've ma they've managed to secure from 0% increase up to until what offer that was presented to them last year. So the worker fragmentation is problematic in shaping the agenda of automization and digitization. The question that was asked by Ukomre Jane Uguti, where is labor movement engaging informal workers? I think at the SAFTU level, during the, SAFT, the launching conference of SAFTU, we came to realize, the Congress resolved that, we cannot be advancing the agenda of workers and not taking into consideration the issues that are affecting informal workers. That is why in our constitution, we do have a level or the layer of the National Working Committee. That National Working Committee is going to take into consideration or it will be constituted by informal workers. So we, we know that SAFTU is still the new baby. We have our own difficulties, but slowly but for sure, we move in there. So I think the issue of informal workers, we are definitely taking it into consideration. And Comrade Devon, my professor. <laughs> You're protected. Yes. I think NUMSA is one of the trade union movement in South Africa that came up with progressive resolution in 2012 about how do we foresee coal moving towards a socially owned renewable. But what is confronting us now as workers, 
is what do we do with the jobs? That one is a fact. We cannot run away from it. And you know, when we have discussion, we recently had a, a workshop that was convened by AITC, both for both NUMSA and NUM. So it means that this alliance, it's, a, it's moving. It was, it was last week that, that a workshop. We, we realized that it is a fact that a, the civil society, the environmental movement, we need, to, we need not to shy away on the issues of jobs. It is a primary concern to us as workers. So I think that will also be taken into consideration when we decide on how our just transition should be structured. And we know that the just transition is the term that is loosely used now lately. So if we are not there as workers in terms of influencing how this just transition should be structured, that's where we will be, um, that's where problems will definitely uh, emerge. Um, comrade Cecilia from Ghana, you ask a question about what have we done as trade union? in embracing the fourth industrial revolution. I think you're talking about this artificial intelligence. And to be honest with you, we are still stuck with challenges of the past uh, revolution. We, in our sectors, we, we, especially the engineering sector, we've got in agreement the, the section that is talking about technological changes. How that's a, a, a clause is structured is quite problematic. Because of it simply says that the employer should engage or consult the trade union before 90 days if any technology it will be a, a introduced in a company. And we know what is consultation. So we are still stuck with challenges of the past uh, revolution. But like I said earlier on that we need a study. A study that will take us through in each and every sector so that we can be able to come up with concrete a, a, a approach on how to a, come up with a, 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 a um, on how do we should we embrace a, the 4IR as trade unions. I think I will end it there. Thank you very much for your honesty, Comrade Rufin, Comrade Lossi, Comrade Reiner. Finally, please feel to comment but also respond to the question of your experiences or the German Union's experiences with, with works councils and co-determination linked to the topics that we've raised in the last 60 minutes. Let me start by making reference to what you said, uh, and I can't agree more, uh, having in mind that the DGB is a relatively young organization because we celebrated last week the 70th anniversary. Why we celebrated the 70th anniversary? It was after World War II. And we established the DGB as a unified umbrella organization of the trade union movement in Germany, in Western Germany, um, to, to be more precise at that time. And <coughs> it was based <coughs> on the historical lesson that before World War II in the Weimarian Republic, the labor movement has been deeply divided. And that was not the only one, but it was one of the reasons why the Nazi regime could take over power. And the lesson was then to have a unified labor movement, a unified trade union movement, and being faced nowadays with a fragmentation of labor market, with segmentation of labor market, where uh, workers, um, uh, they will bring workers in a position to compete against each other. That cannot be. The main task for trade union is to avoid that workers are competing against each other. And the prerequisite is to avoid this competition, this unhealthy competition, that we as a labor movement are unified. This is not always easy. And I can tell you that under the umbrella of the DGB, I have a lot of tensions with my eight affiliates to the DGB, but it is always, 
always more easy to try to solve those tensions internally instead of fighting against each other externally. Because the winner of those external fights are always employers and capitalists and we have to be united. This was our historical lesson and this is why we are partly so successful. This leads to the question of works councils and co-determination. Because also this has to be put in a historical frame. Because as we have implemented in 1951, co-determination in the steel and in the mining industry, the alternative was to go for state-owned companies to socialize those industries after World War II. Uh, and the price we didn't was to get a sort of uh, influence we are calling co-determination. And also uh, from a historical perspective, in Germany in, two, in 1927, in the Weimarian Republic, we got first works councils as plant level. And at that time, trade unions have not been convinced that workers' uh, representation via works council would be the best system we can implement because this has been received at that time as a risk that works councils could be uh, could acting independently from trade unions and making uh, co-management with uh, the employers. Um, so this was also then after World War II, as we have established works council by law again in 1950. Seven, uh, a big battle between um, uh, the unions that we said, okay, is it a good thing or is it a bad thing? We learned our lessons and why uh, the workers' participation system nowadays is uh, successful in Germany. It has preconditions. Works councils are elected every four years. 80% of 180,000 work councillors in Germany are belonging to one of the eight uh, trade unions uh, of the DGB. This is a precondition that we avoid, that they becoming uh, uh, independent from trade unions, having their own agenda with management. No, they are integral part of the trade union movement in Germany. And this has to go hand in hand with a second tool, which is quite important, collective bargaining. Because this has to be seen as a uh, as a system where we have workers' participation, collective bargaining, and strong trade unions as well as strong employer organizations. Because I need strong employer organizations to be able to get results at the negotiation table to make sure that I don't have simply only a signature under the agreement we have reached. No, that's not enough. This agreement has to be implemented. And if I have to implement this, I need strong employer organization who are capable to implement it and to accept what we have negotiated. And here again, works council come into the picture because the works councillors are looking at the plant level that those agreements are fully implemented at company level to have decent salary, working condition, working time, so on and so forth. So this is a complex system we have um, developed over the last uh, 60, 70 years and you can't see this uh, independently from each other. But here again it's based on the historical lessons that we have to try even uh, if we uh, have uh, different views, uh, different opinions in the labor movement um, to have the capacity to speak by the end of the day with one voice. And it is becoming not easier. It's not only because the segmentation of labor markets. Do we cover the interests of unemployed people? Do we cover the interests of people who are earning only a minimum wage? And do we cover at the same time high qualified people, uh, academics uh, with, de with high salaries? Uh, there is a pluralization of lifestyle. There is a pluralization or there is a, a differentiation of interests. And to create a common interest again and again, this is something you have to work on every day. There is no automatism. Uh, and therefore, I think it's so important that uh, we learn to deal with those interests, uh, those, those different interests, those different uh, perspectives. And to make it even more complex, I will finish with an example we succeeded by the end of the day. We are not at the end, but 
If it comes to climate change, the energy sector. We decided in Germany to close our nuclear power stations by 2025. That means more or less in six years. What we are doing uh, with those who are employed uh, in those nuclear power stations, this was possible only because we found agreements, we had an involvement of works councillors to give workers a perspective what's going on after uh, 2025. If I'm not able to give them a perspective after 2025, then certainly they will not join us and they will not be on our side that we have after a long and critical debate in the trade union movement. There have been not only trade unions who have been against nuclear power stations, there have been many new uh, trade unionists who had a, a huge sympathy for nuclear power stations. And it was Fukushima which changed then the nature of the debate. And now we decided in Germany not only that we are closing nuclear power stations by 2025, we will close coal power stations by the year 2038. Again, it's a process and uh, at the same time we have to have these investments in renewable energies and which is quite ambitious. But without investment and without, and, and the experience is, in the mining industries, we had a trade union density by 90%. In no other sectors I have such a huge trade union density. If I look to the renewable energy sector, wind energy, solar uh, energy, trade union density, quite low. Wages are not comparable with the mining industry. This is a big challenge. And here we have to get access again. And therefore I think works councillors have an uh, important role in managing those processes. You have a time perspective, you have a mix of policy tools with investment, with workers' participation, with a strong role of the governments, but also with a strong role of employer organizations that I can uh, establish a safety net built on collective agreements which have to be implemented and have to be a certain uh, guarantee that they will be fulfilled by the end of the day. The big challenge we have all. In Germany, we have the highest labor participation rate after the reunification of Germany. Nowadays, we have 42 million people uh, in work. 42 million people in work. My aid unions have only 6 million members. And I can tell you, this is not enough. So the biggest challenge for all of us is that if we have to be strong in shaping the future, faced with different challenges, uh, with contradictions, with risks, the main power resource we have as trade unions is members. Because in difference to political parties, political parties they have to win elections. But trade unions, to be powerful, need members and therefore I think the joint challenge for all of us is that we will be attractive for members, for workers who become members and this will be based, uh, or this will be more easy based on a unified trade union movement and to avoid competition amongst uh, each other. Thanks a lot. Yeah, I would say Viva, my three panelists, Viva. I could do that another 90 minutes, but we are clearly running out of time. We started late, therefore we are running late. But, but some of us, uh, Barna has to leave at 11 o'clock, Minister has to leave and also Comrade Sengiswa. So I would like to thank the three of you. Uh, we definitely have to do that more often. Uh, thank you very much to uh, the President of Cusato, the President of the DGB, who has a very tough program ahead of him, and also to Comrade Ruf. It's a pity, Rainer, I mean, I have to say that I'm an FES representative, uh, and we heard Lou that you cannot join us for the rest of the day, because we will be listening to uh, more than 20 presentations from different African countries on exactly those topics, but I'll make sure you, you get an idea about the outcomes.